This is Dublin's famous Temple Bar. And no, I'm not talking about the bar called Temple Bar because the actual street is called Temple Bar. Yeah, it's very confusing. Well, the story is this was named after the residence of Sir William Temple, who was an Englishman that was part of the Irish Parliament back in the early 1600s. He set up base here and this was a bar with two R's. That means it barred the river Liffey right next door from spilling over and it, there was a walkway on top of this bar. Well, the name stuck and they removed the R and they called the street Temple Bar. Ever since this has been a very famous area to have some good crack. But wait, I'm not talking about American crack, I'm talking about Irish crack spelled C-R-A-I-C which means having a good time well if you want to tell a friend meet me at Temple Bar make sure you specify meet me at the Temple Bar at Temple Bar and then later on in the night we'll be hanging out around Temple Bar I hope that makes sense for everyone this is where one of the most famous beers in the world is produced Guinness and here at the Stout is where you can drink a pint of Guinness with your own face imprinted on its foam. Let's try it out. All right, now I'm gonna take my photo here at the selfie booth in order to have it imprinted on the beer. That's perfect. Nice one. <laughs> now for a little context. Guinness is one of the most popular beer brands in the entire world. Definitely the most popular coming out of Ireland. It's worth more than $2 billion. Now this is the machine that makes all the magic happen. Just check this out. So this is the process right now of having my photo imprinted on the head of the beer. And right there. <laughs> That's amazing. Does it look like me? All right, let me drink my own face off here with Guinness. Oh, good Guinness. The beer tastes really fresh because it's still made here at St. James's Gate in Dublin, and it gets its water directly from the Wicklow Mountains nearby. In December 31st, 1759, Sir Arthur Guinness, not to be confused with Alec Guinness, the famous actor of Obi-Wan Kenobi, he actually signed a lease for 9,000 years. But under one caveat, they had to pay 45 pounds per year, which sounds like a pretty good deal. But where does this dark beer come from? This is called the Extra Dry Stout. And the reason stouts came to be was because back in the 1600s and 1700s during the Industrial Revolution in England, thousands upon thousands of people from the countryside were pouring into the cities. Beer companies had to keep up with all the demand. However, there was also high beer tax. So in order to circumvent paying some of those high taxes, they started using different types of barley in different levels of maltedness. They end up getting a dark beer, which they end up calling a porter, which end up evolving into the modern day stout. By 1799, the Guinness Company became so famous for the extra dry stout, this one over here, they decided to go full on dark beer. But it was the innovation back in the mid 1900s where they started infusing their beer with nitrogen rather than carbon dioxide. And you end up getting that velvety texture to it. And as you see with the pour, the bubbles look like they're cascading down rather than bubbling up as in with most beers. One of the reasons that happens is because of their unique glass shape, which due to some complicated physics actually makes the bubbles look like they're going down when physically they're actually going up and then going down. That is a good pint of Guinness with a good long lasting head. Mm. Who knew that head could last that long? Stay thirsty, my friends. Cilantro. This hotel in Dublin is partly owned by the band U2. And due to a very funny story, it is the Clarence Hotel, which opened up in 1852 and had 70 rooms here at Dublin's famous Temple Bar. There is actually a bar called Temple Bar, but on this street, it's also called Temple Bar, named after an Englishman by the name of Sir William Temple. However, the Clarence Hotel had a interesting reputation because when the band U2 was formed in 1976, they originally were punk. Bono and The Edge kind of had a rough around the edges look with their long hair. Well, they tried to go to the bar over here at the Clarence and the bartender kicked them out. 
Well, Bono, according to some stories, said to the bartender, next time I come here, I will own the place. 1992, Bono and The Edge buy the place. And it takes them a few years to fully renovate it, more than $8 million. They turn the 70 rooms to about 49 rooms, and it loses a bunch of money. A few years later, they had to give ownership to another company. They still own the building, though they really don't run it anymore. However, back in October 2020, U2 had one of their re-release parties up there where they gave a concert to all Dubliners. Stay curious, my friends, with or without you. This statue of Dublin is of one of the most famous writers in Irish history, Oscar Wilde, known for his wit and biting humor. Originally, the sculptor Danny Osborne was going to make it pure marble, but he decided to use a variety of different stones, including jade, pink thulite, and blue granite. Here we can see Oscar Wilde smirking, looking rather happy. Well, that is Oscar Wilde's side while he was writing plays like The Importance of Being Earnest, also his amazing novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray, and for his witty one-liners like enemies stab you in the back and friends stab you in the front. Or women are meant to be loved, not understood. But he also had a sad story. Here on this side of the statue, we see a rather different posture and a different face him looking rather somber. Well, his life took a downturn when he decided to have an affair with a man named Lord Alfred Douglas. Lord Alfred Douglas was royalty and his father, the Marquess, decided to blast Oscar Wilde and revealing that he was homosexual, which was illegal in Britain and in Ireland. 1895, he was sentenced to jail and did hard labor. This was very grueling for Oscar Wilde. Also, right in front of the statue, we have a statue of his wife, Constance, who was pregnant with their child, and right over there, the bust of Dionysus. Well, he ended up getting very sick and had many health issues while serving in jail. Oscar Wilde only survived a few years later and was buried in Père Lachaise Cemetery, where you can still visit his gravesite today. He is one of the classic writers who came to an early demise due to laws that were too short-sighted. Luckily, they put up this monument in, in his honor, which wouldn't have been possible decades prior. Oscar Wilde, let me know what's your favorite quote of his in the comments. This is the bridge in Dublin that charged a toll for 100 years. It is the Hapney Bridge, and it traverses the River Liffey that runs for 82 miles, and its source is at County Wicklow. Right down there, we see the beautiful Irish sunsets. But what does the word Hapney even mean? Well, it means half a penny, actually. That's how much they charge for the toll when it was built in May 1816 all the way to 1919. But why did they build a bridge in the first place? Well, the city of Dublin gave a ultimatum to the ferry companies that helped people cross the River Liffey. They were in terrible shape, those ferries. So they either had to improve ferry service or just build the bridge. Well, the companies decided to just build the bridge. If people objected to crossing the bridge via a toll, they would destroy the bridge at no additional cost. The people end up paying the toll and they charge for a hundred years. Most likely making their costs back. Anyways, this bridge is right now one of the most crossed over bridges in the entire city of Dublin. This post office in Dublin is littered with bullet holes. We can see them right over here, right by the column. See the one over here, another one over here, all around this entire building. But what happened here? Well, this was the headquarters of the Easter Rising. We have to go back to April 24th, 1916, when Patrick Pierce came here and read the proclamation of the Irish Republic. He was later then declared the president of the new Irish Republic. The British weren't having this. They were already entrenched in the war against the Germans and the Germans started trying to send weapons to the Irish. And then they were tempted to send in soldiers. 
The British started shelling the city of Dublin and the Irish Republicans set up base over here and this was the main area of the fighting. Well, what happened to this revolution? You know, it's interesting reading about the history of this as an American because it's what if the American Revolution turned out really really wrong in the other direction. Imagine if Ben Franklin, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson, and many others were rounded up and all executed. That's exactly what happened during the Easter Rising. They were all rounded up and killed, all seven signers of the proclamation. Today, this still serves as a reminder of the very first steps to Irish independence. And that's why they never really fixed these bullet holes that we still see to this day. And here where now the spire is, which Dubliners sometimes call the Stiffy and the Liffy, used to be the pillar of Admiral Nelson, who won the Battle of Trafalgar. This was blown up in 1966 by Irish Republicans. Luckily, there was no casualties, and it was replaced with this huge, gigantic spire instead. This woman haunts the streets of Dublin late at night. It is Molly Malone. On June 13th, 1699, she died of a fever way too young. And apparently her spirit still roams these very streets. Of course, she is based on the very famous song, Molly Malone. Also goes by another name, Cockles and Muscles. She was a fishwife. But fishwives weren't necessarily the wives of fishmongers. They were women who sold fish on the streets of Ireland. In some towns, they were known to be very beautiful, like Molly Malone over here. But in other instances, they were known to be very foul-mouthed as well, because they had to sell their fish by the day is done. Otherwise, they would lose out on money. Well, the song has become an unofficial anthem of the city of Dublin. But according to local legend, if you touch her assets, you will get good luck. But that will be your choice. I, I, I would ask for consent first, otherwise her ghost might very well haunt you. This was made in 1988 by Jean Rinhart and has become a very popular tourist attraction ever since, as you can see a bunch of people taking photos right behind me. This is the Samuel Beckett Bridge, constructed by Santiago Calatrava, and it's meant to look like a harp on its side. It was opened in 2009, and this harp symbol has been used in Ireland since the 13th century as its national symbol. It was even part of the original flag for the Republic of Ireland. However, this was built by the same guy who's responsible for the Oculus. It's very controversial in New York City because he spent more than $4 billion to construct the Oculus. But this one luckily came at a more reasonable price tag. The price tag for this one was only 60 million euro. So, something old called trouble. What happened? Why, why did you <laughs> spend so much money in New York? Beautiful bridge, though. I really like it. And it's really close to the water, actually, in terms of the street level as well. So, it's not too high. And I love the harp pattern over here. The hardest thing was building these steel beams. There was really only one manufacturer that could build these, and that was in Rotterdam. So, gorgeous bridge, I think, in my opinion. Um, let me know what you think. Is it a gorgeous bridge? And is Santiago Calatrava a awesome architect or not? This Franciscan Abbey in Kilkenny, Ireland used to brew beer for a few centuries. It was originally established in 1234 AD by the Order of St. Francis of Assisi. And then in the 1300s, they started brewing their own beautiful Irish red ale. It became such a huge hit that in 1710, John Smithick bought it out and started a gigantic operation called Smithix. That beer is still being sold to this day. And I had it a few days ago and I was so blown away. It was so delicious. This is not sponsored by them at all, but I love the beer so much that I wanted to make this video about history. And in 1960s, Smithix was bought out by the Guinness Company. You used to able to go on this huge experience tour. It was like a mini Guinness storehouse tour instead of the Kilkenny version. But it closed down recently ago. I hope they resume the beer brewing here in Kilkenny because it's such a delicious beer. And it's nice to know that you're drinking a beer that has a tradition dating back to Franciscan monks. 
right over here. This is the Kilkenny home of the first woman to ever be condemned of witchcraft in Ireland. Her name was Alice Kittler, and the year was 1324. She had four husbands. Three of them died. Each subsequent one was wealthier and had better social status than the previous. Her fourth husband, John Poor, was slowly dying. He was very skinny, frail, and apparently he lost all the hair in his body. This worried a newly appointed bishop who was an English Franciscan. His name was Bishop Richard Ledred, and he accused Alice of witchcraft cursing her husbands, cavorting with demons, and also poisoning all of their stews. Well, he sent a warrant for Alice's arrest to the Chancellor of Ireland. The thing is, the Chancellor of Ireland was Roger Outlaw. First husband was William Outlaw. So they were cousins. He wasn't go going to arrest his cousin. He liked her. Well, Bishop Ledred tried to rally up the people of the town. That quite didn't work. And he even provoked one of the other families, the poor families. The fourth husband was John Poor. They weren't going to mess around either. So they arrested Bishop Ledred and hoping that he would calm down and kind of release everything. He didn't. He arrested a maid who worked right here in this house. Her name was Patronella. Patronella was flogged in public for days. Apparently she lost her mind. Poor Patronella did a confession, saying that yes, she was involved in the witchcraft and that she saw Alice having intercourse with demons. Whether that confession is reliable is another thing. Patronella on November 1324 was burnt at the stake. The only person to be burnt at the stake for witchcraft on the island of Ireland. Alice Kittler was nowhere to be seen. Apparently she left over to England and was never arrested. But she made the life of Bishop Ledred impossible. His property was taken away and he had to fight to get his property and status back. He fought for years until in 1360 finally got it back, only to die a few months later of natural causes. He is currently entombed at St. Canice's Cathedral. And no one really knows what happened to dear Alice. What do you think happened to Alice Kittler? Was she really a witch? Or was she an innocent woman who happened to have a lot of husbands die on her? It happens. This is the oldest building in the entire city of Kilkenny. Only one of two Irish round towers, which you can still climb up to the very top. This is St. Canice's Cathedral, built in the 1200s, right after the Anglo-Norman invasion. Now, according to popular belief, these round towers were thought to be lookout points so people can see Vikings or Anglo-Normans coming from very far away. Well, they were actually a bell tower. There's still 52 of them left on the island, but most of them are laid in ruins. This is one of the very, very, very few that is completely intact. Now, what does Kilkenny mean? Well, this is your answer. This is St. Kenneth's Cathedral. Kill means church. Kenny is a derivation from Irish from Kenneth. And this is part of the Church of Ireland and one of the larger cathedrals on the island. St. Canis, according to legend, led an army against the very last Archdruid of Ireland, completely expelling the pagans and solidifying Catholic Christianity upon this island. Well, there has been a church here dedicated to St. Canis since the 500s, and the very first one built in the Romanesque style was in 1100 with this bell tower. But then the Anglo-Normans built this because the Anglo-Normans, once they came and conquered a new land, they liked to put awe into their new subjects by building a gigantic cathedral. Well, they conquered Ireland and this is what they got. And then in 1650, Oliver Cromwell came over to Ireland and devastated the country. He, according to one instance, took a church filled with worshipers, locked them inside and lit it up burning everyone inside the church. He's also responsible for many massacres across the countryside, including destroying this lovely building where he destroyed the rooftop. 
the cathedral had no rooftop for a very long while until luckily it was restored and now it's one of the more beautiful cathedrals in the entire country look how gorgeous it is I just love coming to places like this. Kilkenny is a wonderful medieval city. You really get a sense of going back into time. Highly recommend it. This is what I love about Ireland. You could be walking on the residential street. Right now I'm in Maudlin Street here in Kilkenny and I bump into a medieval structure. This used to be one of the towers, a part of the Mary Magdalene hospice that treated people who suffer from leprosy and it's still standing here to this day on Do this you know beautiful the street. Of that building, I'm sorry. No, not too much. Ah, that's a very yeah. historical piece. Yeah. It's the funny thing about this area. It's actually a rich history. This actually housed lepers. Yeah, it did, yes. Yeah. Uh, back in the time, and it was an isolation chamber. It's ironic now that we have COVID. Oh, this uh, was the isolation chamber. This was the isolation that's chamber. That's why it's so tall. Exactly. That's why it's so tall. People could escape. And as you can see yourself, yeah. the doors, people can live the gates into it, are very confined. Yeah. And uh, then you had, you had basically, these are more or less little air slits, uh, the windows. Oh, because they didn't want them to breathe through much exactly. to it. To, to uh. it, like, and then basically people were passing by, yeah. they could hand in something and they, they themselves would get infected. Because as we know, it was actually contagious. A bacteria it's, it, it's oh. a, it was a bacterial infection yeah like the plague so this one is a virus right but uh, but obviously back at that time the bubonic plague and leprosy then were the two renowned ones and this was a medieval city so there was a lot of contamination in the water and stuff as well because and you can see this from the old pipes down on the ground and stuff as well so it's, exactly. it, was, it was quite historical there was another little watchtower up there you see yeah that it's one that yeah. ran one down there yeah obviously it's, it's what it's a shame in a way because obviously then through the different centuries you get the modern buildings but then you get something like this yeah here's the other tower a little bit further down Maldon street and is one of the survivors of the original city walls. Visiting Kilkenny was amazing. There's so many secrets like these all around the city and the locals are making my job way easier with their random fun facts that they tell me while I'm filming. This is the famous castle of Kilkenny. It was a very important spot for Strongbow, AKA Richard de Clare, AKA the Earl of Pembroke, an Anglo-Norman who invaded the Midlands of Ireland. He built a earthworks fortification here to see the River Nore and the entire surrounding area. But then in 1207, the King of Leinster built a stone castle and he used black limestone from the nearby black quarry. That's where Kilkenny gets its name, the Marble City, because it's made out of this black limestone. Then in 1391, the butlers took over. The butlers were the official butlers of the King of England, meaning that they were the ones to serve the first cup of wine to the King after a coronation. This tradition continued on for many centuries. The butlers owned more than 2 million acres of Ireland until 1935 when they were ousted from the country and they sold this for a mere few pounds to the Irish government. All of their goods were auctioned off by 1960. The butlers apparently have been trying to get their goods back anytime they see it come up in auction. But this also was severely damaged in 1650 by Oliver Cromwell when he ravaged the country of Ireland in his crusade against Catholicism. In 1825, the butlers decided to remodel the entire place. This was a period of history where the royals of Britain were obsessed with medieval architecture. And even though this was already built in the medieval era, they decided to make it look even more medieval. It took them 15 years to fully remodel the entire castle until we were left with this. Wow. And they had a gigantic park area. But only until recently, they found out that the castle actually was fully enclosed which we see here, the old fortifications. Though most of this castle's history was used more as a home rather than an actual fortification. Nowadays, this castle is a gorgeous, wonderful tourist attraction. I highly recommend going into it. There's so many rooms, so little, so many nooks and crannies, and also beautiful artwork inside is an excellent example of a great Irish castle. This is the most important building in the history of butter, located in the Shandon area of Cork City. This was the Butter Exchange Building. It was opened in 1770, and at its height in the 1800s, 
more than 3,000 wooden casks of butter were brought in every single morning. The name of those casks were named firkins. And here at the firkin center, they used to repair and prepare those firkins. Now it's a ballet school. Also here is where they classify the quality of butter into six different classes. This quality control was used and adopted all around the world. Here they exported butter to all different places around the world, as far as America, to Germany, to the West Indies, everywhere. This was the center of butter in the 1700s, all the way until its closing in 1924, right by here at St. Anne's Tower. And right next door, there's actually a really cool thing. Inside, there is a museum that I think should join the rankings of the Louvre, of the Uffizi Gallery, of the Met. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the Butter Museum. Inside the Butter Museum, you will find thousand-year-old butter that was found submerged in a bog. Yeah, really crazy museum and really buttery goodness. Oh, Ireland, how you buttered me up so much. This is the first immigrant to be admitted through Ellis Island in New York City. Back in 1891, Annie Moore sailed off here from Cove, which at the time was called Queenstown, to seek new opportunities in New York. However, her ship was delayed and she actually arrived on December 31st, 1891, which was the very first day that Ellis Island opened. Annie Moore arrived and lived her days in the Lower East Side. Here are photos of her and here's another photo of her. However, life in the Lower East Side in the tenements was very hard and she passed away at the age of 49 after giving birth to about 10 children, five of them which reached adulthood. Annie Moore's statue, which we see over here, actually has a twin over in Ellis Island in New York City. So it's very fascinating to see this connection between New York and Ireland here, especially since the Irish American community has had such an important impact in New York City history. This is one of the many of thousands of castles that used to dot all around Ireland. It is located in Galway in the Latin Quarter and it's named Blake's Castle. The Blake family moved here in the 1500s. However, there is a little secret because if I were an enemy to the Blake family and I were to attack over here at the door, bomb, 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 give me some coffee, Costa. Right up there, we see a murder hole. Yep, that was a little sliver in order to pour down boiling hot oil. Some type of liquid that will burn any enemy down. Kind of fierce if you think about it. Now this uh, appears to have part of Costa Coffee. I don't know for sure, but this was part of one of the 14 tribes of Galway. The term tribes were standing in for families of Galway that ruled Galway for a very, very long time. But the word tribe used to be derogatory, negative, because Oliver Cromwell came over here and he called those families, oh, they're just a bunch of tribes, savage people. Uh, the name stuck, so they still call it the 14 tribes of Galway. And their flags can be seen all around the city. These are the 14 tribes of Galway. The 14 families who were merchants that ruled Galway for a very, very long time, such as the Deans, the Martins, the Browns, the Fonts, and many others. One very famous family we're coming up across over here are the Lynches, where they still have a castle right in the historic center. Of course, the Lynches no longer own it, but the castle is still there. And we have many others over here. The term tribe came from Oliver Cromwell. Eh, many Irish people already know that Oliver Cromwell was kind of a... Eh, he was a big D, I'll say that. And he called these families tribes, kind of just putting them down, saying, oh, these are a bunch of savages. Savages, just a bunch of tribes. But they were actually merchant families, really well set off. They had uh, their own fortifications. They spoke probably various languages, including French. So, yeah, Oliver Cromwell 
terrible, terrible guy, but those are the families and you'll see those flags everywhere in Galway. Stay curious, my friends. The remnant of this home from the 1400s has a message in front that says, remember death. But why such a grim message right here in this home? Well, for that, we have to go back to 1493, where the mayor of this town, James Lynch, usually went over to Spain and had a lot of commercial dealings. Well, he met the son of a merchant named Gomez, who was very charismatic and very smart young man. So he brought him over here and hosted him here in West Ireland. Well, he ended up becoming very good friends with his own son, Walter Lynch. And they were both known as very good-looking, very charismatic young men that got all the Galway girls. Well, Walter was in love with one specific Galway girl, Agnes. And as they were about to get married, Walter, in a jealous rage one night, accused Agnes of cheating on him with Gomez. He started chasing Gomez all the way to the seaside, and Gomez ran and ran and ran, and as they got to the seaside, Walter stabbed him and killed him. Later, he found out that Gomez did such no thing. He did not cheat at all and have an affair. He was wrought with guilt and he ended up confessing to his own father, the mayor. The mayor was a man of justice. How, what would he do now in this case? He had to fulfill his mayorly duties. He went to trial, Walter was convicted and the execution date was set. However, the townspeople were all yelling and saying, no, no, do not convict your son. They couldn't bear this entire family drama. They couldn't bear a father having to execute his own son. But the father was a man of law. The executioner refused to lynch the mayor's son. So the mayor took the execution into his own hands, tied the rope around his own son's neck and pushed him off right off this window, leaving him hanging to death with an entire town looking. This is where apparently the term lynching comes from and lynch mob. Now that is mostly legend, no one knows exactly for sure, but that term was used, unfortunately also in America quite a lot. This is still a marker of that terrible, terrible stance for justice. A man that had to abide by the law and the son that unfortunately broke the law. James Lynch was actually part of the 14 tribes of Galway and the castle still stands here to this day. Now it's an AIB bank uh, and there's a beautiful facade in front of it. And if you go inside the bank, you actually find some uh, memorabilia and some history about the Lynch family. A person from the town told me that Part of it is a replica, but the window is still real. This is the famous bar from the John Wayne film, The Quiet Man, directed by John Ford. It's the Pat Cohan bar, located in the town of Kong here in West Ireland. When they were filming this in uh, June 7th, 1951, the town recently just got access to electricity. But well, people weren't used to electricity back then, so they actually refused to have electricity installed because they found out they had to pay for it. Quiet Man was a very interesting film because John Wayne, when I first saw Quiet Man, I was like, oh, is this the guy from the Westerns? Yeah, John Wayne made a, quite a departure from being that classic Western hero to being a guy who's an ex-boxer coming over to Ireland to connect back with his roots and falling in love with a nice red-haired lass. That was the main plot point of The Quiet Man. And when they originally filmed in this location, which is the bar in the film, and a lot of scenes take place here, it was actually a hardware store. And they shot on location, which was also very rare back then. There was even films that took place like in Wales that were completely shot in the set. They actually had to only turn the camera in a certain direction because if they turned the camera too far, you would see the hardware store. So let's take a closer look at the Pat Cohan bar We're over here. And the red-headed lass was Maureen O'Hara. And here we see the scene that was shot on location. We see some memorabilia. There's the DVD, the Oscar. Uh, John Ford, the director, who also collaborated with John Wayne in movies like The Searchers, he won Best Director for this film. It was a big hit. However, he was working with Republic Pictures and it was really hard to convince the producers, the studio, 
to make this movie. So he had to do it under one condition. John Ford and John Wayne had to make a Western. A Western that was very short and it was going to be very commercially successful. That Western was the Rio Grande, which ended up also being one of the bigger Westerns. Fun being here. Also, there's a statue of John Wayne and Maureen O'Hara. Well, guess I'm in Ireland. That's the best John Wayne I could do. <laughs> Kurt Russell does a better impression in Big Trouble in Little China. Stay curious, my friends. This is Dublin Airport. I'm heading back to the States on this airplane. And I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who's been watching these Ireland videos. Visiting this country has been an absolute blast. The people are so friendly and warm. The history is so rich. The food is actually really good. And oh, I really like the coffee as well. And I got so many amazing comments throughout these past month exploring all around Ireland. Now, if you want to keep watching a few more Ireland videos left, because I have, I recorded a bunch, so I have a few more left, definitely. Be sure to continually check my page because once I'm back in the States, uh, my videos are going to pop up more to the people that are there rather than over here in Ireland. Nonetheless, you can follow me on YT and there I'm doing long videos, a bunch of long videos of Ireland. And I'll be continuing doing long videos around the world. And that's YT. Go to Urbanist Exploring Cities. That is the name of my channel. And on Instagram, I post a lot of photos. Urbanist Live. So thank you everyone so much for tuning in. Thank you everyone for saying hello on the street. It was so awesome to meet many of you in real life. And as I always say in every end of my video, stay curious, my friends. Back to the States I go.